What I'd like to talk to you about today is exercise as medicine. And um, I've got a few things that I'd like to, to just let you know about the whole exercise as medicine initiative, as well as some of the work going on in our lab that is related to this type of uh, topic. So back in about 2007, um, in fact, November of 2007, a joint initiative by the American Medical Association and the American College of Sports Medicine wanted to set up an organization or a, a basically a, a construct whereby we could explore the possibilities that exercise is medicine. To be honest, this was a really bold move from the medical community. I think we as exercise physiologists understand that exercise can be extraordinarily beneficial to individuals who participate in those type of activities. But the American Medical Association has been sort of reluctant to acknowledge that. Um, so in 2007, this constituted a really major move, um, kind of merging two communities um, for the good of the, for the people. And in fact, uh, some of you may know that a former president of the American Medical Association at about the onset of this uh, whole initiative was uh, Dr. Rohack, who is uh, at the Health Sciences Center here at Texas A&M University and um, was part of the Huffines Institute, which is associated with our department. So what do we really mean by exercise is medicine? I think most of us in the room would readily accept that physical activity, and in this case we're just going to call it exercise, is important to health and well-being of individuals. I think some of us will even go so far as to say that it could be preventative in a lot of the diseases that are starting to crop up in our society, namely type 2 diabetes, cancer, and chronic obstructed pulmonary diseases. I actually have some data, and my, my lab has been working on two of those, um, type 2 diabetes and cancer, and I'm going to share you, uh, with you some data regarding that. So another thing that's, that we're becoming more or increasingly aware of is that our society is getting older. There's a lot of us baby boomers out here, and uh, we continue to persist. We have, you know, pretty good health care nowadays, and so there's going to come a time where our our retired society is going to outnumber our working society. And so um, being able to remain, a f uh, remain functionally independent is a huge concern for individuals. And hope of, uh, hopefully all of us are aware of the fact that, that active lifestyles may help us maintain our functional independence. So the Exercise of me uh, is Medicine initiative was to make physical activity and exercise a standard part of the global disease prevention and medical treatment paradigm. We want to uh, basically enhance awareness in the medical community, make level of physical activity an actual, an actual part of the diagnosis when you go to your physician, and incl include physical activity counseling. If that ladder comes up, um, there's going to be a lot of job opportunities for exercise physiologists as they go into the field if we can get the medical community to embrace the exercise physiologist to help design those programs. If you want more information about the Exercise is Medicine initiatives, you can go to www.exerciseismedicine.org and they have, they have everything there that you could ever want to know about this particular initiative. Well, that brings it, uh, the talk, that's the exercise as medicine part from the standpoint of a global initiative. I want to talk more about some of the data that we're collecting in my laboratory. Uh, I work, uh, as Dr. Kreider uh, told you, in the Muscle Biology Laboratory. It was founded by one of our more revered faculty members, uh, Dr. Bob Armstrong, back in 1992. Um, the mission statement has evolved since Dr. Armstrong retired and, and I kind of took uh, the helm of that particular uh, laboratory, but my goal is to explore, explore physiological mechanisms related to the control of muscle protein metabolism. Pretty simple statement. Uh, basically, I want to know what makes muscle grow and I want to know how to keep it there when it, starts to, when, when it quits growing. Um, and so we have a number of studies going on in the muscle biology laboratory. We look at the effect of exercise training on mechanisms of cellular muscle, muscular growth, and, and that's kind of at the forefront of everything I do. 
we're really interested again in what makes muscles grow. We're also interested in how aging affects muscle protein synthesis. We're interested in how disuse or microgravity affects musculoskeletal mass. And we're really interested in how resistance exercise or exercise in general affects muscle protein homeostasis when you have type 2 diabetes. And then lastly, in kind of a, a interesting, I've, I've actually highlighted a pathway on how we came to this particular study, but uh, we're interested in how exercising muscle might affect breast cancer. All right, I'm going to start out with diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is associated with the loss of insulin sensitivity, leading to higher blood sugar. This is closely associated with obesity, hypertension, poor blood circulation, neuropathies and retinopathies. And the initial concept in type 2 diabetes, and something that uh, the medical community and the research community both kind of agreed on initially, was that impaired insulin sensitivity resulted from a defective signaling somewhere between the insulin receptor, which I'll highlight for you, and the translocation of glucose transporters to the surface membrane. So the treatment has been historically, and still to, in, in, to, to a great extent, has been to stimulate glucose uptake through pharmacology. In essence, what we want to do is remove the high blood sugar, because the high blood sugar seems to be the problem. All right, don't mean to overwhelm you here, but I just need to get you on the same page as me. Um, what I'm talking about by something between the insulin receptor and the uptake of glucose uh, by the cell is that we have embedded in our plasma membranes on virtually every cell in your body um, these proteins, transporter proteins that allow glucose to come out of the blood and basically into the cell to feed the metabolic systems inside the cell. The more glucose transporters you have in that plasma membrane, the higher the glucose uptake. All right, so people with type 2 diabetes, when insulin hits the receptor, it sends a whole bunch of signals through that cell to stimulate the translocation of a bunch of these membranes that, or uh, membrane-bound uh, glucose transporters that are laying resident inside the cell from inside the cell to the surface membrane where you can put more glucose transporters inside or in the plasma membrane to stimulate glucose uptake. Um, if I didn't overwhelm you with the last one, okay? How many of you guys have played that game where someone over here, like Mary Beth, has a little, uh, little slogan she wants to say? She whispers into the ear, Susan, and by the, end, by the time we get back there, well, probably before we even get to Dr. Woodman, what Mary Beth said initially is not even close to what Dr. Woodman heard. Okay, That's the whole concept behind broken or defective signaling, that there's something wrong. What I'm sure, all I'm trying to show you here, and this is from SA Biosciences, you can find this on the internet, is that there are a lot of signals in here that could be broken by the time you want to stimulate glucose transport or translocation uh, to the surface membrane. So that's the initial concept when it comes to how this all works. You have a broken signal, let's fix the signal. So I will tell you, and the way I've prefaced it, you should probably have already kind of come to the conclusion that I've put so much emphasis, emphasis on the defective aspect that what we're learning is that it may not be all that defective. Um, and in fact, there have been numerous labs throughout the world who have basically said, ah, I know where the broken part is, and they go to fix it. And for a little while, it looks fixed. But then the, the whole um, syndrome of diabetes comes back. So when studies have tried to correct portions of this signaling cascade to fix it, it hasn't always proven f fruitful and in fact has frustrated the scientific community and the medical community for a long time. Type 2 diabetes has been around, it has been diagnosed for m many, many years, and yet we still don't have that problem fixed. 
Um, and because of that, we have now kind of stepped off the type 2 diabetes and just started calling it metabolic syndrome. In essence, it could be this, but when we fix it, it goes away for a little while and then it comes back. But that's still fixed. Something else is broken. So the whole concept now is that there's this syndrome of events that occurs that leads to this insulin in, uh, uh, glucose intolerance or insulin resistance. So there's been a paradigm shift. It's subtle. Not everybody's picked up on it. But bottom line is, is that the reduced insulin sensitivity may not be due to the fact that the system's broken at all, but actually a coordinated attempt to prevent glucose transport. So new thoughts are basically leading investigators to believe that insulin resistance is likely a result of the cell sensing, I've already got too much energy here. Why in the world do I want to bring in even more energy? Okay, so that obviously if you have too much energy or you're sensing a glut, it could be because there's just too little demand for that energy. So here comes the exercise studies. And actually the exercise studies have been going on for a long time. And it's reasonably well accepted that a single bout of aerobic, aerobic type exercise, go out and run, go out and walk, get up and move, okay, um, can actually lead to a transient, and what I mean by transient is a relatively short-term improvement in your glucose tolerance. There was a lot of work coming out of Washington University in St. Louis from John Hollisey's group. There's work from the Copenhagen Muscle Research Center um, under Henrik Galbo and Eric Richter. East Carolina University with Linus Dome. Michigan State University, a guy named Mark Rogers, right off the bat showed that aerobic exercise was helpful to somebody with glucose intolerance. And then of course the August Crow Institute with Eric Richter, um, they've all dedicated, these groups have dedicated a lot of effort toward our understanding of glucose intolerance. So what they, again, what they found is that people with impaired glucose tolerance can actually look normal if they're not too far gone with acute exposure to a moderate intensity aerobic exercise. So the question is then, as I've already told you, the cell might be sensing too much glut of energy. Is it due to an actual increase in insulin sensitivity or is it more because, because I've gotten up and moved, I've reduced the storage capacity of the cell, which allows me to put more stuff in there, kind of like my garage. I move something out just in time to move something else back into it. <coughs> All right, so depending on what camp you're in, um, whether you think it's, it's uh, a defect in sensitivity or whether you think that it's it, or an increase in sensitivity with, with um, aerobic training or a change in storage capacity, there does not seem to be a really pronounced training effect of aerobic exercise on glucose tolerance. And if you're a Dane, you would say, well, we think there's a, a, a training effect, but it's very short-lived. And in fact, all the studies somewhat agree that within about 48 hours after that acute bout of exercise, that somebody who is glucose intolerant, if you can get them back into that normal rate stage, by 48 hours, they'll be back to the glucose intolerant stage. All right, and in fact, um, this, I, I'm, I'm going to walk you through this primarily because I'll be confused if I don't. <clears throat> but what we have here is insulin resistant subjects that underwent three glucose challenges. This was work done by Jens Jörn Larsen. He's a Dane. And the Danes were with that whole insulin sensitivity is improved with training. Um, but he kind of flipped them on, he flipped his own group on their ear in that and why we, we think that there could be a storage issue here is that um, they, had, they had the same person undergo three glucose challenges, the glucose tolerance test. Basically, it's a test to, to determine whether or not you're sensitive to insulin. And so they put this glucose challenge in, um, and they were either tested in a control, control state following cycling exercise or after a caloric restriction that was equivalent to the caloric expenditure of the exercise. And they separated this by about three weeks of trial. 
So in one group, they just did a glucose challenge, or in, in one time they did a glucose challenge, the other time they subjected you to exercise and then measured glucose, and then the third time, not necessarily in that order, they just said, okay, you spent X amount of calories during your cycling, we're going to eliminate those calories from your diet and see what impact that has on glucose tolerance. The first, the, the, this is the glucose, blood glucose in the individual. The first one uh, in the control state, you can see they have very high blood glucose in response to the challenge. But whether they exercised, and some of you in my 433 class would know which one was the exercise and which one wasn't by, based on not only the glucose but the insulin spikes, but we won't go into that in this class. Um, but the bottom line is, um, whether you expended the energy on a cycle, ergometer, or you restricted those calories from your diet, you improved your insulin sensitivity in both cases. Okay, which tells us then that, okay, cycling may be important for you and there may be some change in insulin sensitivity, but it could be just that, that you need to provide space for glucose to go once you take it in. That really affected the, the Danes too. They did not like that whole outcome. But Jens Jern actually won the Wander Award, which is a very distinguished uh, traveling um, lectureship that, that the International Biochemistry of Exercise organization uh, puts together. And they let him go all over the world to spread this gospel, so to speak. Um, anyway, diabetes and exercise. Um, aerobic exercise seems to help short term anyway, it, which is a good thing, right? Um, on one hand, you might not call that exercise as medicine. You know, we get up and we move and we can improve our insulin sensitivity. But I would counter with the argument that if you don't exercise, it could be potentially devastating. So uh, we need to get up and move. That's aerobic exercise. Most of my work has been with resistance exercise. And what we have found is that depending on who you read and the uh, level of intensity is that resistance exercise doesn't seem to impact glucose tolerance without exercise training. So a single bout of resistance exercise isn't probably going to affect your glucose tolerance all that much. Is that good or bad? It's great in some respects because... Um, I don't know if you've ever worked with a type 2 diabetes population, but frankly, those folks don't like to exercise. And probably because it hurts. They have neuropathies. They have situations where going out and pounding the pavement can be sometimes very difficult for those individuals. So my concept, and in fact, I did some of this work at Ball State. Um, my concept was, hey, let's put them in an extra, resist, let them do resistance exercise where they don't have the constant pounding and see if there's some kind of benefit of that exercise on their glucose tolerance. At the very least, it doesn't hurt you. On the, unter on the un alternative side, the extra physical activity could ultimately help you. So um, work that, that associated, with, uh, that is uh, early on associated with resistance exercise. And this was tough to get published early on, I got to tell you, because uh, uh, people want to see a major improvement and where we're preaching that, well, at least you're not getting hurt. <laughs> um, but Case Western Reserve, there's a guy named John Kerwin there. He was doing a lot of this work. When I was at Ball State, uh, this was my master's thesis. And funny enough, it got picked up by Night Reader Press, and it was global, and I was in Copenhagen, Denmark, reading the newspaper, and I found my study in there, um, which was, uh, I wasn't forewarned either. That was kind of an incredible deal. I said, somebody did my work. <laughs> and then I realized that it really was me. <laughs> um, Copenhagen Muscle Research Center, again, was involved with this type of work. And uh, so there's a cautionary story tail here, and particularly with individuals who are insulin resistant, and if they engage in higher intensity resistance exercise, there's, it's been shown that that might even lead to a transient elevation in insulin resistance. And if you go to see your physician and you just had a really high intensity resistance exercise bout, and they go, oh, you're worse than you were, we got to put you on bigger drugs or insulin or whatever, 
Just let them know, hey, wait a while, time out here. I, I've been training, it'll go away. Chest me again in another 48 hours because that's what happens. Higher intensity resistance exercise leads to a transient short-term reduction in glucose tolerance, and, but it will go away in 48 hours. Okay, so aerobic exercise, we see in a transient improvement. Resistance exercise, a transient elevation in insulin resistance. To me, that smacks that something's going on in the cell that's, that's rather coordinated. Um, to follow that up, almost every study that has looked at resistance exercise training, not an acute bout or response after acute bout, but exercise, resistance exercise training, have all shown improved insulin sensitivity. Virtually every study that's out there. It is not known whether that improved insulin sensitivity is due to actual changes in the signaling pathway that, that enhance the sensitivity or a storage availability issue again. Bigger muscles, bigger reservoir. And at first, I bought that. I'm like, oh, okay, I have more places to put glucose, therefore bigger muscles should mean improved sensitivity. Well, that's fine for a while, but once you fill up the boat again, uh, putting more water in the boat is gonna sink you still. So uh, I'm not convinced that it's basically a storage deal, but maybe there are really changes going on in insulin sensitivity. So depending on that camp, uh, what camp you're in there, um, there does appear to be a training effect, but generally only when exercise facilitates muscle growth. Typically with resistance exercise though, we not only get muscle growth, but we get a loss of body fat. And body fat, as I've already told you, obesity is closely associated with insulin sensitivity. All right, so we've done a number of studies on diabetes and resistance exercise. And um, most of the experiments that we're doing, and among others, is that have led to new insight on the control of glucose homeostasis following exercise. We know that aerobic exercise stimulates specific enzymes that enhance glucose uptake. But those same enzymes that enhance glucose uptake are directing signals against protein synthesis. We have only so much ATP in our cells. And when we're trying to put away glucose and store it in the form of glycogen, that's expensive. And if we're trying to make proteins, that's expensive. Typically, the cell wants to do one or the other, not always both at the same time. So we have, we've tracked down a number of these enzymes that basically one will enhance the uptake and suppress the synthesis. Or on the other hand, you can have elevations of protein synthesis after exercise, and those same elevations in synthesis might actually be impairing signaling for glucose uptake. So we actually believe that the problem with insulin resistance is that the muscles are sort of locked in a constant state of rapid protein turnover, and I'll have data to show you that, which then leads to the suppression of insulin-stimulated glucose uptake. This is work from Mats Nielsen, who was a former PhD student who actually got his degree. He got his PhD. Um, he's now working at McMaster University with a, a gentleman named Mark Tarnopolsky, who's pretty big in our field. And what I have here is just protein synthesis in a number of cellular compartments, muscle cellular compartments. And over here I have um, these F animals are fat stood for fat, <laughs> fat animals. You can't do that in human studies, by the way. <laughs> you know, you can call a rat fat and get away with it, but don't try that if you're doing human work. It doesn't go over very well. Um, as opposed to fat, we have lean animals. What I will tell you is that in this particular strain of animals, when they're fat, they're also very insulin resistant. And in fact, um, this particular model, it's called a Zucker rat, this particular model has been used as a correlate um, to human diabetes in, in the animal world. So when there's things that you can't get your human to do in an experimental paradigm, you can always ask a rat to do it. And typically they won't tell you no. Um, 
But this, the S stands for sedentary versus exercise. So we had basically set up an acute bout of resistance exercise. Because it was a rat, oh yes, we do train rats to lift weights. I'm not going to show you the video because every time I try to do that in this type of setting, it fails. And then I spend more time working on the video and, and I miss part of the data that I want to show you. So, um, but there is, it's actually posted on YouTube somewhere. Um, we hired a model rat to do the work. It wasn't one of our weightlifting rats, but uh, anyway, so what I have here is basically, this is just mixed muscle protein synthesis. That's what the FSR stands for. It's basically a measure of the rate of protein synthesis. And what I want to show you here is that the, the unexercised fatty rat actually has a higher rate of synthesis than the lean sedentary. This one's glucose intolerant. This, one, or this one's glucose tolerant. When we add exercise to the mix, we have no change in the anabolic response here. We have a subtle change in the anabolic response here. And if we look at myofibular proteins, which are the contractile elements in the muscle, you know, we can see that actually higher rates of synthesis um, with or without exercise here, and then there's an exercise response in the lean animals. This, we've, we've measured a number of muscles in response to exercise, and almost every time it comes up that our obese animals that are diabetic have a very high rate of synthesis, and we can't bump it up with exercise. Whereas the lean animals sometimes have a lower rate of synthesis than, than exercise or no exercise, but exercise helps rescue that. So they can, they can respond to exercise. So I had the opportunity to actually give a talk at Experimental Biology this year where we're going to look at this, we're calling this anabolic resistance, so to speak. This is the acute training. Um, and, and we don't need to focus on the rest of that, but, and this is another one of those pathways. I have one more after this, but um, this is actually a pathway that my PhD, former PhD student is working on for his manuscript, second manuscript coming off his dissertation in our lab. And we have literally looked at 90% of these signaling molecules to find out what's going on with glucose intolerance and glucose tolerance with and without resistance exercise. And I will I'll tell you right here, we have some gray boxes highlighted, and I apologize, you can't read them very well. Um, but we're pretty well convinced that some of the differences between a lean and obese sucker rat, or glucose intolerant to tolerant rat, is that the signals that are necessary for stimulating glucose uptake in these animals have been shut off because the muscle proteins or the, the muscles more interested in generating protein. And you're like, well, okay, so these guys should have big muscles, right? They're generating a lot of proteins, but they don't. And in fact, across the board, across species, humans, rats, um, anything in between it that, that can exhibit glucose intolerance, You'll find that if you, if you equate the amount of muscle mass they have on their body relative to all the other morphology of their body, they all have smaller or lower muscle mass than what you would expect for that individual. Um, our obese sucker rats, they're big, they're twice the size as our lean rats, but they have about half the muscle mass. Glucose intolerant individuals, they may, some of them are pretty big folks, but when you start measuring their muscle mass, it's smaller than what you would expect. And so if their synthesis is up and they have smaller muscle mass, it likely means that their protein degradation is also high. And in fact, what our study, the second study is looking at is that it seems as though with diabetes, for whatever reason, which we can't put our finger on yet, they seem to have lost not only insulin sensitivity for glucose uptake, but insulin sensitivity to prevent protein degradation. Because that's another and very important outcome for insulin is to prevent protein degradation. And it looks like your ability to stop protein degradation is lost. And in essence, the cell says, I'm losing mass. One way to help offset that loss in mass is to turn up protein synthesis. And it does. And Unfortunately, some of these enzymes that lead to, and this is the protein synthesis aspect, some of those enzymes that lead to this enhanced protein synthesis virtually turn off glucose uptake. Okay? So this is where we're targeting. 
Um, the, the one other caveat that I'll throw in there is that virtually every study that I've done where we've done exercise training, we always see a more pronounced effect of resistance exercise after training on reduction of protein degradation. Okay? By reducing protein degradation, we may alleviate the need to have enhanced synthesis and basically allow for the restoration of glucose transport. And in fact, we've done that type of study where we picked on two signals in the cell. We shut them off in a glucose intolerant animal that had high rates of synthesis. We shut off that, that degradation aspect. We shut off those signals. And not only did protein synthesis go back to normal, but we restored glucose tolerance. The actual glucose uptake went back up in the cell. All right, so what do I want to say? No matter what type of exercise you do, exercise is considered to be an effective therapy, i.e. medicine for individuals with glucose intolerance. You just got to get them up and get them moving. Aerobic training appears to be dependent on the last bout of exercise, whereas resistance training may be dependent on the training response. So you could argue that, well, man, aerobic exercise, I may have to do that for the rest of my life if I want to keep my glucose uh, tolerance, right? Well, I'd prefer that over taking insulin or some sulfonylurea or a TZD for the rest of my life to maintain my insulin sensitivity. Seems like the better way to go to me. Um, resistance exercise training, uh, I, I, acutely, probably not so good but you have to maintain a trained state, so that's something you need to do the rest of your life, too. All right, not com although it's not completely understood, uh, the med medicinal effect of exercise serves to maximize that flux through the metabolic system, which should improve glucose uptake and disposal. All right. Cancer and exercise. So I've, I've closed the book on diabetes, sort of. Um, I'm going to finish up with, with cancer and exercise. But first, I want to show you the evolution of thoughts behind us moving in this direction. It wasn't that I woke up one day and said, I think I'm going to study cancer. Because I haven't solved everything with glucose intolerance or protein synthesis. And I don't want you to think that I just wake up and serendipitously just jump into something. Because um, on the surface, me going into cancer research has nothing to do with glucose intolerance on the surface. So um, the evolution that I'm going to show you, yep, I have another pathway, um, is from glucoregulatory control to cancer killers. Once upon a time, I actually worked at the Copenhagen Muscle Research Center. I was there for a couple of years and in the Galbo lab. And because of my opportunity to be there, um, I got involved with some of the cancer research that's going on now. I think most of us know that um, at the onset of exercise, whether it's sprint training, sometimes even in anticipation of exercise, you'll start to see an elevation in blood glucose. Okay, and this is this is generally uh, this is just a generalized response, and this elevation of glucose isn't because you just ingested more glucose, it's because you have this big storage facility in your bodies called the liver. And the liver stores a lot of glycogen there and it makes that glucose available for you, which is an important substrate, especially during sprint activities, for you to be able to perform that work. And so invariably, as you begin to exercise, you have this increase in, in hepatic glucose output and after the exercise, you'll see it kind of come back down to normal. So hepatic, HGO stands for hepatic or liver glucose output, um, can arise from a number of things. Um, and in fact, all of these things have an effect of, of, um, on, on hepatic glucose output in the liver. Um, sympathetic innervation of the liver will stimulate hepatic glucose output. Changes in hormone profiles either allow for hepatic glucose output. So at the onset of exercise, my 433 class should know, you have a drop in insulin. That drop in insulin at the onset of exercise isn't because uh, you no longer need insulin. Well, it is. <laughs> uh, you don't no any longer need insulin to stimulate glucose uptake in the muscle because the muscle can, contracting muscle 
can stimulate its own glucose uptake. You don't need insulin to do that. But you need insulin to go down primarily because insulin prevents hepatic glucose output. And now I need glucose to perform that work so my insulin levels will go down at the onset of exercise. We also, if we feel like insulin or glucose levels are too low, we have another hormone called glucagon that will actually come up, um, which stimulates hepatic glucose output. So when I was at the Copenhagen Muscle Research Center, now, there are some things you can't do in human research here that they kind of look the other way in Scandinavia, okay? But, so imagine this study. We wanted to bring in liver transplant patients where we blocked all catecholamine output and see what happened to them with, uh, insulin, uh, with hepatic glucose output. <laughs> Not probably going to happen here. Um, so Henrik Galbo was really interested in this hepatic glucose output with exercise. And there was raging debates on which was more important. Was it the catecholamine response, changes in sympathetic nervous drive, uh, change in hormone profiles? What is it that leads to this hepatic glucose output? So what better place to study that than somebody that's just got a brand new liver that's not been innervated, and you have to put all these blockers into the body so that they can you know, basically not get too excited about anything. Um, and sure enough, he got these people on a treadmill. I don't know how you do that. You get these people on a treadmill, and they had the same hepatic glucose output as somebody who was fully innervated with a full catecholamine cascade. Well, that sounds odd. How does the liver know to start spitting out glucose? So when you account for everything in the liver, especially in these transplant patients, Hepatic glucose output is still elevated at the onset of exercise. So Galbo, um, I, I think the world of this guy, he's pretty clever. He's usually about 20 years about ahead of everybody else. But basically said, you know, there's got to be something that's stimulating hepatic glucose output. And, you know, a logical source for that is the contracting exercise or contracting muscles. There's got to be something coming out of muscle that stimulates this hepatic glucose output. All right, well, let me just give you a little backdrop here. Muscle is not supposed to release anything that can affect the body. The reason I got into muscle physiology is because I had two kids, and they talked back to me. I wanted to look at something that couldn't talk back. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is that muscle traditionally has been thought to be a slave to the rest of the system. That the central nervous system says muscle contract, no back talk. That would be great at the house. I thought I'd study that in muscle, okay? But that's maybe not what's going on. Um, so we wanted to find out whether indeed something could be released from contracting muscle that could stimulate hepatic glucose output. Now, how did we accomplish that? Um, I had the opportunity to work with Jim Jefferson, as I'll show you later. He actually wrote the book, so to speak, developed the methodologies for the rat hemicorpus. So what I'll tell you is that we take this rat and we euthanize it. We put it under deep anesthesia and we euthanize it. And so bottom line is the upper half of this animal is dead, but because of some very sophisticated equipment and stuff, we can kind of take over the lower half of the animal by perfusing blood through it using special pumps that actually have a pulsatile blood flow, just like the animal does. We can maintain it at a certain temperature. We make the blood, okay? So, and we take everything out of the animal, the renal system, the, the adrenals, we take everything out of that animal that could influence what's coming in or out of that muscle and we put our own stuff in there. So we perfuse the hind limb of the animal, and then in this case, we collect what's coming out of the hind limb of the animal, and we can measure glucose uptake, we can measure protein synthesis, we can measure a lot of things using this particular model. So the other cool thing is that we can control muscle contractions in that animal. We hook electrodes up to the sciatic nerve, we can stimulate the muscles to contract, and then we can kind of see, oh, okay, so we're putting this much glucose in, we contract the muscle, we see how much glucose is coming out, ah, so we know what glucose uptake is across the hind limbs of the muscle with and without exercise, so to speak. 
Everybody with me? Well, in this case, what we wanted to do is something called a parallel perfusion apparatus. And I got a picture of it, and you may want to close your eyes. But bottom line is we can stimulate these muscles to contract. We're perfusing the hind limb of this animal and then literally perfusing the liver of another animal. So we have one animal doing the work and the other liver seeing if it will respond in, to that work. That's what it looks like. It's right out of Young Frankenstein down to the black and white picture. Um, but basically we had two animals hooked up in parallel. One animal would be serving as the muscle donor, um, the, the blood coming out of the muscle and perfusing the liver of the other animal. And then we just look at hepatic glucose output. What we see here is that in a sedentary, under the sedentary conditions, that hepatic glucose output continues to fall as you perfuse it. When you first hook up a liver to this apparatus, it will spit out a little more glucose because there's subtle changes in pressure. We kind of wait till that settles down. And then we would stimulate the hind limbs and we could see that within minutes after, in fact, we, we gauged the time and distance of when the contracting muscles stuff should reach the liver and invariably we got a huge response. Okay, and in fact, hepatic glucose output went through the roof. It's short-lived, but it almost looks like a catecholamine response. So in Galbo's infinite wisdom, he says, I need you to go back and check for catecholamines to make sure there wasn't anything residual in the animal. Sure enough, no catecholamines. So we did another study to find out, well, what in the world could this be? Um, so we actually took muscle homogenates from, in, uh, from, from rats and we fractionated them out to find out, okay, what what fraction of proteins, what size proteins would it be that elicited this response? And I'm not going to show you any more um, than this, but other than the fact that this fraction 5 right here is uh, about a 5,000 Dalton protein size, maybe a little bit smaller, um, that stimulates uh, hepatic glucose output. And they're still in the process of doing proteomic analyses to find out what what protein in that particular fraction might be stimulating hepatic glucose output. Pretty cool. Another case where exercise is important. All right, so how does muscle talk back? When we went to go publish this years ago, they said, no way. Muscle can't do that. There is no way. And we fought and we fought to try to get this stuff published and they wouldn't publish it because we all know that muscle can't release factors that can affect, other than a generalized response, affect anything else in the body. Um, but we do have direct evidence that something's coming out of a uh, muscle that can affect the hepatic glucose output, which suggests then that muscle does have endocrine-like features. Fortunately, about Five years after that, a guy named Dave Kelly from the University of Pittsburgh presented some work from an adipocyte that releases substances that have specific responses, endocrine-like responses in other tissues. And so the community starting to relax a little bit, that muscle, well, maybe something can come out of muscle. We'll give you that. Um, but there have been a number of findings since then that suggest that muscle may be able to communicate we know that muscle is able to make insulin-like growth factor, which is released um, and can actually be released into the system in a hormone-like action. Um, cytokines, we know muscle can make cytokines, um, and, but it's generally thought that these cytokines don't have any specific tissue targets, but just have a generalized response over the body, but the muscle can make them. I worked with Esther Dupont Verstegen, who was, I think, the first, if not first, it was published within a few months, basically showing that brain-derived misnomer, neurotrophic factor, is manufactured in skeletal muscle. And at this time, we're not sure whether it's released, but BDNF is profoundly important for memory. And in fact, Dave Wright, on, in this department, is doing a series of experiments that some of you may have been involved with, trying to find out whether BDNF goes up in response to exercise, circulating BDNF, and how that might enhance your memory, um, which should tell you guys, rather than staying up all night studying, study, go run. Makes sense to me. 
So, I also had the opportunity to work with Benta Clarendon and Peterson at the Copenhagen Muscle Research Center. She's an exercise immunologist. We put a grant together and then I left. Um, she got it funded, but basically there were 400, there, there's at least 400 myokines, stetocytokines, we're calling them myokines, that can be released from, um, uh, uh, released from muscle during contraction. Some, some of these myokines, or many of them, are probably go up in circulation with physical activity and we think have an order in the training associated my metabolic changes that go on um, and perhaps even much, much more. Our lab is trying to find out whether um, the release of these exercise derived myokines actually have an impact on cancer. So how do we get to that? Michelle Holmes, Harvard Medical School, about seven years ago showed very nicely in a study that women who exercise the equivalent of walking one hour per week at basically a two to three mile an hour pace, okay? Some of you say, that's nothing. I call that a severe workout. <laughs> These folks had a lower risk of dying. And in fact, there was a 20% reduction in mortality or, uh, with these individuals. Women who did a little bit more, and I mean a little bit more, three to five mile an hour uh, per week, or three to five hours at that same pace, had the lowest risk of dying, a 50% reduction, telling us that physical activity is very important for um, breast cancers in particular. How does it work? Most of us acknowledge that exercise can be important therapy for individuals, right? Um, but it's always thought to be some indirect effect, such as you may be changing the metabolic nature of your body, you may be losing weight or fat, law, or fat. you'll have hormonal adaptations, um, and we cannot discount the effect of the, the individual mood states, right? The, the whole psychology of that individual may be better with, with exercise. So we know that exercise is good for you. Um, our particular studies are devoted towards the concept that there are not only, in addition to all these, there may actually be a direct effect of exercise on breast cancer. So here's my last pathway of the day, I promise. Hopefully you'll find it just a little bit entertaining. How in the heck did I go from glucose regulation through protein synthesis to get to cancer research of all things? I had a really good friend named Matt Hickey. He, we're still good friends. He's now at Colorado State University. I met Matt when I was at Ball State. We came in on the same day, and yes, like here, I was late there. I showed up first day of classes. I was late for class, but fortunately, Matt and I think a lot alike, and we were hunting down this class together. Um, anyway, I think the world of this guy. Very, very bright individual. He, he's now the director of the Human Performance Lab at Colorado State University. Um, might even be a department head now. Wow. Um, anyway. Bottom line is, he wanted to go work with a guy named Peter Farrell at Penn State. He couldn't get in at Penn State, so he came to Ball State. But in the two years that I knew him there, I really thought, hey, this would be pretty cool to go work with Peter Farrell. But Matt's a smart guy. There's no way if Matt couldn't get in with Peter Farrell that I could get in with Peter Farrell. So I met Bill Kramer at a National Strength and Conditioning Association. He was the, at the Center for Sports Medicine at Penn State. And I said, oh, by the way, can I go to Penn State, maybe get a PhD? I'd really love to come to your place. I love your stuff, da, 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 da. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, put in your application. And we'll see, you know. Um, my goal was if I worked with Bill Kramer at Penn State, I might be able to sneak into Peter Farrell's lab every now and then and learn a little bit from him. Much to my chagrin, Bill Kramer wrote me back and says, you know, I really don't have a slot for you. Uh, your work, after all, isn't as, uh, in, at all what I'm interested in doing. But there's another guy on campus, Peter Farrell, who is very interested in you. Well, <laughs> gold mine, okay? <laughs> so I went to work, uh, yeah, much to my surprise and much to the dismay of Matt Hickey. When he found out, because he was bragging that I got in at Penn State and I was going to work with Bill Kramer when I said, well, I'm actually working with Peter Farrell. We didn't speak for like six months. <laughs> but because of that, we, I was interested in resistance exercise. I was interested in protein metabolism, how it's affected. We started the ERPA series of studies there. 
um, which stood for the Intracollegiate Rat Power Lifters Association. We had shirts, logos, and little uniforms for the rats, the whole nine yards. But we taught, taught these rats to lift weights. And the bottom line is we can get them to lift weights. Our squats, our rat squats better than most humans in form. Um, they really do a good job and we can get them to, to train. We can get them to grow muscle the whole nine yards. Um, but uh, because I was inter interested in protein metabolism, uh, Peter Farrell brought in Jim Jefferson, who was basically a co-chair on my PhD program. He was the guy who wrote the book, as I said, on the rat hemicorpus. And in the methods of enzymology, if you want to learn how to study protein synthesis in a rat hind limb, basically he's the guy who has that paper. That's his paper. So I worked with him. But because Peter thought that I was there to get into Bill Kramer's lab, and that Bill was interested in protein uh, metabol or in, in weightlifting, we also pulled in Bill Kramer. The, real advent uh, the really cool thing about that is that he had a grad student named Scott Gordon. He and I are very good friends. He was at Penn State. He's now at East Carolina University, um, who had a girlfriend named Donna Korzik. <laughs> Donna Korzik still at Penn State University. She's like, she was the Rihanna Dean Queen. Um, she's gone on to a number of things, but she's a heart person. Um, I know, Chris, I had to admit that there's a heart. Um, but anyway, she had a good friend named Kim Westerland. Well, because she was into bone research, we sent some of our bones from our studies to Kim Westerland. Well, Kim Westerland... Um, Basically, I've never met her before, but we published a paper years ago, and uh, so it was kind of cool that we had this little serendipitous thing going on. Well, because Peter Farrell worked with Henrik Galbo, Henrik Galbo uh, was interested in me coming over there. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Xiao Xiao Han, who was the one who did those liver perfusion type experiments, and I, I basically brought her the techniques, and she got the dissertation out of the deal. I was a postdoc over there, and um, which then allowed Linus Dome to review that work. So we were, and, and he got very interested then in the type of work that I was doing. And because he hired Matt Hickey, both of those guys basically convinced me to come to East Carolina University. So I was at East Carolina University for a little while. Um, but while I was at Penn State, a guy named Bill Evans, I promise, I've got a motive to my madness here. <laughs> Bill Evans became the director of the Knoll Research Center. And because he, I, I think I was on his, he was, he was on my dissertation committee, and it was his first dissertation committee while I was there, or while he was there. And, uh, but anyway, he was really interested in my work, and he took a job at the University of Arkansas for medical, school, uh, medical sciences, where he took a guy named Todd Trappy with him and then hired me, and so I come in. Well, Todd had a really good friend named Per Tesh. Per Tesh is a, a Scandinavian researcher who is interested in um, NASA-related work, loss of muscle mass, and so we developed the flywheel technology, a different type of resistance training for rats, and then he and I published several papers together, but we have now changed the Intercollegiate Rat Powerlifter Association to the International Rat Powerlifters Association because yes, rats lift weights in Sweden. Okay. <laughs> well, to make a longer story even long, grr, I don't know, the three of the four of us actually um, got interested. Tesh actually came to UAMS to work with us two years because he got this big grant from the European Space Agency, but they didn't have any money. So they said, why don't you go talk to NASA? They got money. Just tell them you got a funded grant from us and they'll fund it. Ha, ha, ha. They did. <laughs> but he had to take a position with us. Well, so while he was there for the two years, um, we all had this clever idea that, you know what, NSBRI, National Space and Biomedical Research Institute, they have this really cool program. Why don't we see if we can become a consortium school? So we developed a grant and ended up that, that we, we won the consortium uh, application. We got, we are, uh, NS, uh, UAMS is now a consortium school for the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. And because of that, I got on Sue Bloomfield's radar. And Sue Bloomfield then was doing a series of studies and said, hey, we have a job opening down here. Why don't you see if you can come down here? 
And I said, all right, I'll put in my application. And I got the job. So now I'm here. <laughs> well, Kim Westerlin then left bone research, sort of, and went into cancer research at the University of Colorado for Health Sciences Center in Denver. Pretty cool. Well, she had this, she ran across this study that basically said, uh, you know what, there's something going on with exercise and, and breast tumors. But we need to study this a little more systematically. Donna, didn't you have somebody in your past that did some kind of work like this? Donna says, I don't know. Let me ask Scott. <laughs> Scott basically was hired by Linus Dome, and Linus says, oh, yeah, that's Flucky's work. <laughs> oh, Donna, tell your friend Kim that it was Flucky. Kim, it was Flucky. <laughs> Sue, do you know a guy named Jim Flucky? I heard he might be at Texas A&M University. And so, same methodology as before. Okay, so we have this rat hemicorpus, we, we perfuse things through it, and bottom line is, instead of just measuring glucose analysis or whatever, we, we dry this down in a special way, we put it in a medium that that's, allows it to be conducive to breast cancer cells or cell culture, and then we grow up breast cancer cells in culture, and we introduce this media that animal to the, the breast cancer cell lines and see what impact it has on muscle or on cell growth, breast cancer cell growth. We can do the same thing here too where we can stimulate that muscle to contract and then with another series of plates we can introduce that contractile perfusate as we would call it onto these MCF7 cells and see if it has an impact. Guess what? So we have basically two sets of cell lines. They're all identical. MCF7's, MCF7 is, uh, as I showed on that other one, that's a breast cancer cell line. Okay, it's easy to grow up in culture. And basically what we wanted to do then is we took these, this is the basal quantities of cells, basically. Um, and then from the same animal now, we have perfusates collected without stimulation and with stimulation. Without stimulation, these cells proliferate just like you would expect. And in fact, when we have just superimposed controls, they, they look just like the controls. Okay, um, when we expose those MCF7 cells to the, the media that we collected from exercising muscle, completely stop cellular proliferation. <coughs> okay, that's a cell culture plate. What else can we do? Well, I will tell you right now, much to, probably to your dismay, if you're animal lovers, Rats don't die of old age, especially the inbred strains. They really don't die of old age so much. Most of the rats that we deal with actually die from tumors. Okay, these guys will grow tumors. Um, and then there's some rats that are really grow, good at growing breast cancer tumors. Okay, so we decided let's do the same set of experiments, but instead of introducing our perfusates to cell lines, Let's inject them into tumor-bearing rats, see if it has any effect. And these rats are pretty quiescent. The only difference is that we inject them either with a perfusate that was collected without contractions or during contractions. And I'm only showing you the three and four week data here, but they all started the same. Not only did we stop proliferation of the breast tumors, but it actually looks like we've suppressed breast tumors in these animals. Okay, so uh, to our knowledge, these are the first data really that directly show that there could be something coming out of skeletal muscle during muscle contractions, exercise, that actually stop or shut down breast cancers. Um, we are um, basically, um, we've targeted some mechanisms we, we are now acknowledging that our work is at least lead, leading us to believe that the nuclei of these breast cancers, which are pretty out, much out of control, that's what's dying off. But it's not affecting the normal healthy cells. And so we, we haven't decided uh, how we're going to approach that. I am working now with Dr. Steve Reekman, and basically we have a, a, a secondary aspect of this study where we've incorporated Larry Dangott, 
and between the, uh, uh, the, the three of us, we're trying to isolate, like I, I was showing you with our research in Copenhagen, something coming out of muscle to affect hepatic glucose output. We're actually trying to highlight and isolate what it is coming out of contracting skeletal muscle that may affect cancer cells. And we're in the process of doing that right now. Um, Always you have to acknowledge folks that help you, um, and I'll, I'll start out with Dr. Reekman because he and I have been working together uh, a lot of this on this cancer stuff. In fact, he just got a sabbatical, or he's got approved for sabbatical. He's going down to MD Anderson, and he's going to work with some cancer docs down there. To we, we have tried to get this stuff funded, okay? We're, I'm a physiologist. I'm trained as a physiologist. Um, Dr. Reekman is trained as an exercise physiologist. We go into the American Cancer Institute with a really cool idea, and they love the idea, but like, who do you think you are submitting this to all these cancer guys? Okay? Um, and so our goal is to gain some more credibility in the cancer world, and so Dr. Reekman's going to go down to MD Anderson and work with cancer docs and try to, to basically get those folks involved. I'm trying to get a guy named Jerry Shea up at UT Southwestern who was really intrigued with our work when he visited last year um, to see if he'd like to participate. But they all acknowledge it's a really cool idea. It's just they wish they had somebody in the cancer world come, to, come up with it. Um, I have a number of PhD students that have filtered through my lab. Um, many of them have PhDs now, but Amanda Davis did all the MCF7 cell work. Um, we, she's been here about as long as anybody, but for some reason she thought it'd be cool to have not one, but two children during her PhD program. Um, so she's basically at home with her second child in uh, a number of years. Uh, Mike Wiggs, who's now at the University of Florida, was also in, involved with that. He's working with Scott Powers down there. Heath Gazer has a position as a physiologist. Can you believe this? With the US Navy. He's in Groton, Connecticut. One of a handful of positions that the Navy or the Armed Forces offers. Um, to, to act, he actually works as a physiologist, exercise physiologist with the US Navy. Mops Nielsen, as I said, he's at McMaster University. Uh, he did all the signaling work that I showed you. Nick Green, who wasn't my student, he was Dr. Krause's student, but thanks to the graciousness of Dr. Krause, he kind of camped out in my lab a couple years. And, uh, Landed a great job, uh, postdoc, just got funded by NIH to, to do a, another year on his postdoc. He's with Zen Yan, uh, the guy who basically discovered PGC1-alpha um, and first to isolate it. Um, he's at the Virginia Med School right now. And Justin Dobson, who just took a job with the uh, Gatorade Sports Science Institute and who really needs to finish his PhD. Um, uh, he's down there now and he's trying to get his feet on the ground and hopefully he'll be back to, to complete his work. Everything, I'm a, actually defend his dissertation. Um, and then Kevin Shimkus, who's actually over here in the corner, he's, uh, he's my baby. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, he, he's been in the lab, he's really savvy, he's carrying the lab right now, um, and he's got a, a group of folks that, that are doing a lot of cool work, we just keep trudging through. So with that, um, oh, and I, I can't forget um, Kim Caroline Strange and her husband Rob who um, came to us and we started developing this protocol on the MCF7s. She is like out of the country <clears throat> and very hard to find right now. Um, so. Uh, I would have loved to, uh, we, we need to uh, talk to her a little bit more. So with that, I would just uh, say thank you for your attentiveness and...